So I'm going to talk about our experience porting Android to our hardware platforms. That's our developer board, like the Hi5 Unmatch, as well as our uh, latest series of Hi5 uh, performance cores. So a little bit of background. Uh, back in June, uh, Lars Bird from, from Google provided a, uh, a talk at the RISC-V Summit Europe that went over Google's status in porting Android to RISC-V more generally. Uh, there was a lot of great points in the, t in the talk. If you haven't seen it, you should see it as well. Um, well, I want to highlight a few of the quotes. The important thing to note is that Android on RISC-V is happening for sure. Uh, it's going to be a tier one platform, and uh, Google's putting a lot of effort into it. But most of their testing has done so far has been on emulated platforms, so QMU. And what we at Sci-5 want to do is we want to have an Android distribution that works on that we've tested on our hardware. So we want to make sure our hardware is ready to support Android out of the box, um, that we've verified it already, and that our customers can use it to build Android products. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the best uh, app and system library performance to provide the best uh, experience for users. And, and by getting a, a Android port to our pre-silicon platforms before we've even taped out a, a chip, we can help accelerate the integration of new ICE extensions and new platform security features in the Android ecosystem. So uh, the first problem we challenge we run into when porting Android to our RISC V platforms is that of, of compatibility, which isn't really something we can solve in software uh, because it's, it's more of a policy issue, and that is that to be considered Android compatible, uh, a device has to meet the requirements of the Google's published compatibility definition document and pass the CTS. And that one of the requirements there is meeting the ABI required for apps. So if apps are compiled against a specific ABI, which tells it which ICE extensions those apps can use. Uh, in the case of, of RISC-V, Google said it's going to be RVA-22, or most likely, it's not official yet, but the latest guidance is RVA-22 plus vector plus vector crypto. So apps can use those instructions, and if you don't implement all of those, then apps are going to crash, uh, which means that you know, your, your device can't be Android compatible if it doesn't meet that ABI. So for some of the existing SOCs we have, like the uh, FU740 that's used in our unmatched board, it only supports RV64GC. It doesn't support the entire requirement of the Android ABI. So we're never going to be able to support Android officially, and, have an, and it will never be Android compatible um, because it, it, it doesn't meet the requirement. Uh, but that Android is open source. So we can build something using, that's based on the Android source code that's not, uh, it's not Android compatible, but is, is very close, and we can run uh, an Android-like operating system on it using the Android open source project. Uh, though our, our performance series, that it, the, our newest chips, do support all the instruction set extensions required by Android, so they could be used in Android compatible products. So to, I'm going to go through four different things that we, we uh, challenges that we overcame when porting Android to our platforms. Like I said, the first one is going to be that, that requirement for ICE extensions. So if you want to be able to run an, or build Android open source project for a device that doesn't support uh, all of the Android, all of the ICE extensions that Google is, is expecting to be in the Android API, then you're going to need to change several places throughout the source code. Uh, first is you know, the compiler flags used to build native code, uh, the pre-built libraries, because not everything is built as part of the AOSP platform. Some things are pre-built, like the tool chain. And then the, 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 some of the system libraries, like Bionic, which is re recently was switched over to use vector versions, uh, vector-optimized versions of the string and memory operations, and the ARC compiler and interpreter. Ideally, we want to be able to support various sets of ICE extensions from the same source tree. So we don't just want to rip out all of the vector optimizations. We want to be able to turn those on and off conditionally based on what target we're building for. So to do that, Android provides board config variables that we can customize the target compiler flags for a specific device. There's an architecture and a CPU variant. Uh, on the right there, there's sort of the, the default CPU variant is called generic, and that refers to basically what's the minimum ABI required by Android, which is the RVA22 plus vector and vector crypto. So to add a new one, we just need to add a new one to the list in that file there, and then map it to a new set of compiler flags. So we just add the dash march to whatever the target you're building for is. And that takes care of all the native code uh, that's built as part of the ASP platform. For everything that's pre-built, you've got to rebuild it. Uh, so the tool chain is built separately, uh, and then th what's important is that includes runtime libraries like the C++ standard library. So you got to rebuild the C++ standard library. It's easiest just to rebuild the whole tool chain because Google provides good instructions on doing that. So there's a, there's a readme file in the tool chain repository, which is that the, the screenshot from. So rebuilding the tool chain will get you a rebuilt version of the C++ standard library with whatever ISA extensions you support. And the, the way you change that is it, there's just a mapping from the Android uh, target triple to the architecture, the ISA string. So just changing that, uh, you know, it's like a two-line patch 
and there's an example of where Google added VBB to it. So you can just go in and, and remove or add whatever extensions you want uh, to rebuild the C++ standard library. Uh, if you wanted to have, this is one case where you can't really uh, have multiple versions. Uh, there'd be a bunch of build system changes to be able to do that at, at uh, select between multiple versions at, at build time. So for right now, we've just set the minimum RV64GC for internally for our use because that's the minimum uh, set of ice extensions we're targeting. There's a couple other places where pre-built libraries are uh, that you would need to copy the tool from the tool chain builder from another uh, build uh, when, when building an ASP platform. And then we get to the ARC. So ARC has an interpreter and a compiler. The interpreter just runs on the device. It, it's uh, just assembly code that, that uh, is a lot of uh, basic blocks that the, the uh, uh, interpreter chains together. So since this code is only built for the target device, we can just use the preprocessor. Uh, since we've already set up the C flags, right? In the couple slides ago, we talked about setting up the C flags. So since we've already set up C flags to, for, to have the right ICE extensions, the preprocessor just tells us which ICE extensions are available on that device we're building for. So you can just use the, the normal preprocessor extensions uh, to, to decide which, whether to use the optimized or maybe a fallback instruction sequence for if you're missing the ICE extension. And I've uploaded patches for this to AOSP Jarrett uh, for ART up to last week. Um, Google has, has said that they're not interested in supporting devices that support less than the ABI, so they don't plan to merge these, but they're at least available if you're porting to some platform that needs these patches, you can at least download them and use them instead of having to re-implement yourself. On the compiler side, the compilers run both on the device for on-device application. When you like install an app, it, it compiles the app ahead of time, but it also runs on the build machine when you're building the Android platform itself. That way, all of the apps that are in the system image are pre-optimized when you boot up for the first time. So that means if you're running on, say, like a building on an x86 box, this code is compiled for x86, and the, the compiler doesn't know which instruction set extensions uh, the target device supports. So in this case, we, we make use of that target CPU variant variable again, uh, and that gets plumbed through via command line argument to the ARC compiler, uh, and then eventually ends up in the set of bit mask of the instruction set features supported by the uh, target device. So if you, if you just need to add code mapping the variant you've added for your CPU variant to this bit mask, and then the ARC compiler can use that to select instruction set sequences, again, based on uh, specifically what that, that device supports. And so this is all dynamic. And again, patches for this are on AOSP Jared, but probably won't be merged. The second challenge we ran into is the fact that, uh, especially when running on like a pre silicon emulation platform, uh, the, the hardware is really slow, and some of our older development boards are also pretty slow. So uh, Android code contains a, a bunch of arbitrarily selected timeouts, uh, and a lot of these timeout values are selected based on the, the existing baseline hardware that's out there. And oh, it's good enough, it doesn't crash on, 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 you know, on my system, so that's got to be a big enough number. Uh, but sometimes it's not when you're running on really slow hardware. Especially uh, when we started working on this, uh, art performance was an order of magnitude worse. So uh, it was uh, a lot more running into timeouts at, at that point. So thankfully, that's, that's been mostly resolved at this point. Uh, but there, there's still some cases, like I said, especially on emulation, where we, we need to increase those timeouts. So Android actually provides already a property to do this called the hardware timeout multiplier. So you just need to set the system property, and it will, it, it's literally a multiplier for every timeout value in the system. Or not every timeout value, most of them. And so the changes I had to make were using that property uh, and hooking it up to, to some of the additional timeouts, like in the Bluetooth service, uh, in the launcher, in uh, the system server watchdog itself, uh, to take advantage of that multiplier to extend the timeouts uh, when running on uh, FPGA hardware that might be you know, 100 times slower than, than your, your basic machine. Uh, on on a, an actual uh, tape dot SOC, uh, so there's those changes, and then uh, to actually access the the Java API from modules outside the system frameworks, there's another change, or it's possible to just read the system property again uh, directly uh, outside of the frameworks. The third challenge is graphics. Uh, a lot of RISC-V SOCs don't contain a 3D GPU, like for example, the the D1 only contains a 2D GPU, which which doesn't support OpenGL or the unmatched board, the FU740, doesn't have any graphics hardware at all. It relies on some external PCI Express card. Uh, but Android requires a functioning display pipeline to be able to actually boot, you know, boot to the home screen while it has to render the home screen somewhere. So that requires at least a frame buffer. It requires at least some sort of OpenGL implementation, whether the OpenGL ES implementation 
whether that's hardware or software. So the minimum, we can use VKMS in the kernel to emulate a frame buffer, and we can use Swift Shader or Mesa to do software emula emulation. Uh, and that's sufficient for if we're gonna do a CI environment or for, for, for testing. But for interactive use, we really need hardware rendering. So uh, like I said, on Unmatched, on we need a, a sort of a PCI Express GPU, a desktop GPU, but these aren't really well supported for ASP because desktops aren't really what ASP is AOSP is targeting. Uh, so it ships kind of old versions of the open source graphics software stack. So uh, we went through various phases in trying to get something working, and so uh, sort of from top to bottom is, is what order we did them in. First is just using LLVM, oh, sorry, using uh, Mesa soft pipe. So we didn't get, have an LLVM that could build for RISC-V, because uh, LLVM 3.9 doesn't even know what RISC-V is, uh, and uh, have to override the uh, the driver used by Mesa because it's, it detects it's a, it's a radon GPU and wants to use the radon driver, but we couldn't compile that with the LLVM. So if you override it to SoftPipe, that worked. Uh, we were able to get radon's uh, Mesa driver working by integrating a third-party project to get a newer version of LLVM built and, and installed on the device. Um, but that's a really big library to install on the device, and we didn't really want to go with something that had a, a third-party, large third-party dependency. So the next solution was using uh, Angle to translate a, uh, OpenGLES to Vulkan and using Mesa's uh, Vulkan driver for Radon, uh, which can use LLVM itself or it can use an internal backend for shaders, uh, uh, turning the Vulkan shader intermediate representation into the actual uh, instructions for the, the Radon GPU. So we were able, able to remove the LLVM dependency uh, and by making a, some small patches to the uh, upstream Mesa build system and mini, GB, uh, mini GBM to remove the dependency from there, just using dumb buffers uh, for, for uh, allocation, which does have some performance impact, but the desktop GPO is a little bit overpowered for what Android needs anyway, so it's not too much of an issue. So this minimizes the amount of, of patches and third-party dependencies we needed. Uh, but for that headless configuration where we don't have a graphics card, we still needed uh, software rendering. So we used Angle plus Swift Shader, which is actually the same thing that's used in Google's uh, Cuttlefish virtual device. So we can just reuse the configuration from there. But we didn't do that first because it wasn't actually uh, supported until July when uh, Google integrated a newer version of LLVM into the uh, Swift Shader project that had a RISC-V backend. And then the, the fourth uh, issue that we ran into when trying to set up a CI environment, uh, and this is really specific to, to doing something like CI testing using Android, is that we wanted to set up something that was not only headless, but also diskless. So there's not really any dependency on anything outside the, the emulated CPU uh, and SOC. So Android doesn't really care about the underlying block device. It's, it's got a pretty good abstraction for uh, what, how to access the block devices. As long as we create some symlinks in slash dev slash block slash by name, it'll find the, the partitions and it doesn't really care where those symlinks point to. However, the, the, the code responsible for creating those symlinks only handles a, uh, certain uh, kernel subsystems where it looks to find block devices, like platform devices, uh, Zen virtual block devices, and uh, there's one other, but it's not network block devices. So if you want to do something like MBD or iSCSI, you're going to have to uh, patch that to support uh, network block devices and create symlinks for those. And then you actually have to set up networking and, and create the, you know, connect to the block device before Android expects the disk to be available. Thankfully, there's already a hook very early in the init ramfs that allows you to uh, basically run a, a shell script, and we can use this to set up networking and connect to our block device. Uh, by default, it'll also run an interactive shell, but I, I have a, uploaded a patch to, to Jared, I don't know if it'll be merged or not, uh, to only run the interactive shell if the shell script fails. That way you can use it for both the interactive debugging purposes if you don't provide a shell script or it fails, or you can use it just to do some target-specific setup uh, for, a, for a CI environment. And this works great, uh, as long as the block devices are there, everything in Android uh, uses them and there's no problems until NetD starts and rewrites all your networking configuration and disconnects you from your block device. Uh, because it likes to take over a network interface, uh, if it knows about it, it will close all the sockets, delete all your IP addresses and reconfigure everything. So the easy solution is to just use a dedicated network interface for block device traffic. Whether that's a second net, uh, ethernet card or a virtual interface on top of your ethernet connection. That way, NetD doesn't know about the interface that's uh, doing your block device, tra device traffic and won't touch it. Uh, and then that will continue working uh, throughout the boot process. So we use a Mac VLAN because that's the you know, simplest to configure. 
there's one small adjustment uh, gotcha there still is that you have to use a, uh, a routing table that will exist once NetD eventually rewrites the routing rule table. So uh, Android uses a bunch of routing rules to use different routing tables per interface or based on uh, you know, various policy. And so the default routing table isn't used at all. So if you just set up your net, your just you know use ifconfig or ip to set up your networking, it will be in a uh, in a rule table that that doesn't a routing table that doesn't get used, and you you won't be able to connect to your to your block device after netd starts. So it, in that case, you just use one of the routing tables that does uh, exist later in the boot process. So you just you can go ahead and pre-create it. Uh, you have to do it by, by number because the, the file providing the names isn't available in the in MFS. Uh, but 97 happens to be the one it uses that's just pulled out of the NetD source code. Uh, so with that, you're able to boot uh, an Android device uh, using uh, whatever ISA your Android device supports, uh, network boot it and, and run CI test and, and use it uh, interactively to, to, to uh, uh, you know, see performance and that sort of thing. Uh, so going forward, uh, Sci-Fi is investing in upstream first development. So uh, I've, I've pointed out a bunch of times where I, I said I uploaded patches to Jarrett. The idea is that uh, we, we don't want to have to be maintaining a downstream AOSP distribution. We want to minimize the amount of patches we're carrying. So as much as possible, we're upstreaming things to AOSP or the kernel mailing list or Mesa, you know, as, as appropriate. And we want to you know, support Google's uh, generic kernel interface once that's defined for RISC-V because uh, that hasn't been released yet. And then we're also working on performance. So we've already done some things, like we've, up, uh, we've upstreamed uh, vectorized string memory copy routines to uh, Bionic, the uh, Android libc. And we've also upstreamed vector crypto implementations to OpenSSL. And those I will eventually filter back down into Android. And we're also working on other uh, library optimization. Since we have Android working on, on our, our latest performance series of CPUs, uh, in an FPGA environment, those provide a great PMU we can use to measure performance and do better, do a lot of profiling and, and actually measure, uh, you know, the data-based uh, performance optimization for the, the libraries and, and that are used within Android. Uh, there's a few resources that are, that are in, will, hopefully will be useful to you if you're interested in Android and RISC-V. Uh, the main one is uh, Google's Android RISC-V 64 issue tracker, which is sort of a clearinghouse for people's experiences trying to get Android running, uh, issues with Android mainline, and, and, and sort of a big to-do list. Like if there's, if there's things you, that, that need to be done to get Android working or working performantly on, on RISC-V 64, there's probably an issue for it there. Uh, RISC-V International also has a SIG, Android SIG, if you're a member. And then uh, there's just a link to the things I've uploaded to Jarrett. And, there are, and the, the third-party AOSP ports for some of the other uh, RISC-V SOCs that you could buy developer boards for today. And with that, any questions? So we have time for one question, one or two questions. Any question? Oh. Uh, hi. So you started off the talk by saying Andro Android for RISC-V is real, it's coming. Mm -hmm. But then you had a pretty long list of things that weren't ready yet, a lot of a very long list of things that aren't going to be merged. Uh, is, is it still your view that like Android is, is some Android on RISC-V is going to be commercial in some sort of reasonable future? That's question number one. And the second one is, if you were talking to Google directly right now, what, what's like the one thing, most important thing you would tell them to work on first? What's the most highest priority? Thanks. So to answer your first question, yes, I believe Android is definitely happening. So some of this is just sort of workaround for the fact that we don't have developer board hardware that supports the Android ABI. That it will be coming, it's just not available right now. So like if you go to the, the dev room, you can actually see an unmatched board running Android and play around with it. So it, 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 these are challenges that we've overcome. So I, I don't think there's, this is you know, reason to believe that, oh no, it's not possible. It's definitely possible, it's definitely happening. Uh, it's just not there quite yet. And I don't, I don't determine the timeline on that when Google decides to officially release Android for RISC-V, so I'd say that's up to them. I, I can't really uh, speak to that. I think there are a, a lot of, I, I don't know that, I haven't really in a position to say that, but I think a lot of people have, have said that they really would like to get the ABI finalized. Though a lot of that's sort of waiting on on the, final, the ratification of the various specs that may or may not be in the finalized ABI. I think that's it. So thank you very much.